Hi everyone, I'm Ming Zi, and today I'll be taking you through the basics of net zero and what a net zero target actually is. Although the term is bandied about a lot, net zero is not a monolithic concept. It is important to understand the complexities behind it to be as transparent and clear with our legal drafting as possible. Net zero is the point where there is no net impact on the climate from greenhouse gas emissions. There are two main ways of reaching net zero, reducing emissions and removing emissions. Emissions reductions would include switching to low emissions technology like solar power and improving the energy efficiency of buildings. Removing emissions involves things like carbon sinks, both natural ones like forests and man-made ones like carbon capture and storage technology. Net zero is a concept this is why you hear it being applied to multiple entities at multiple levels, and this can get confusing at times. Governments, like the UK, take a whole-of-economy view of the net zero transition. Investors and shareholders speak about net zero financial portfolios, so they are assessing the degree to which the companies within their portfolio, in aggregate, have plans to reach net zero. Individual organisations have net zero strategies for their business operations. Net zero is the vocabulary that the international community has rallied behind. It's what the UNFCCC, COP conferences, organisations and financial institutions are using. But what does it mean to have a net zero target? If you follow the media's coverage of climate finance, it might seem as though everyone under the sun is setting net zero targets. But here's the rub. One person's vision of net zero may vastly differ from another's. The key is to look behind the label of net zero to what the target actually is, how it is calibrated, and what accountability measures are in place. There are shades of light to dark green for net zero targets, and as lawyers, we need to be live to these nuances when we draft. There are seven key elements of a net zero target, and I'll be taking you through these in turn. Within each element, there is a spectrum of ambition. Different organisations and countries are on different stages of their net zero journeys. At TCLP, the expectation is that, regardless of where you start, that you are climbing up the ladder of ambition. The first element of a net zero target is scope. Carbon emissions are bounded following the greenhouse gas protocol's scoped approach. Scope 1 emissions are direct emissions occurring at source, which the company owns or controls. If you are a logistics company, this might be the fuel and emissions by your heavy vehicles. Scope 2 emissions come from the energy consumed by a company. This would include the energy consumption of a business's office blocks. Scope 3 emissions include indirect emissions from the company's entire value chain, even though some sources are not owned nor controlled by the company. This would include the emissions of all of your suppliers. These figures are taken from Vale, a Brazilian metals and mining company, and as you can see, the majority of its emissions are in scope three. The international consensus is that a credible net zero target must include scope three emissions, because if not, how do we ensure a whole of economy transition? There are several difficulties with this, including a lack of high quality scope three data, a lack of control over those emissions, and issues of double counting. A couple of solutions include setting materiality thresholds, such as a threshold to include all of your significant emissions categories so that only a maximum of 5% of overall emissions are omitted. Or you could stipulate that only particular sectors with high scope 3 exposure have to disclose, like oil and gas and automobile sectors. We need to consider how best to include scope 3 emissions in our drafting, ensuring that we are reducing and removing as many emission sources as possible. The second element of a net zero target is warming. I like to think of this as the area under the graph, or in terms of cumulative emissions. Recall the definition of net zero. It is the point where there is no net impact on the climate from greenhouse gas emissions. This is a point of time. It says nothing about the emissions that released before we get to net zero. 
In other words, net zero can be reached at many temperatures. We can reach net zero here, here, and also here. The more we delay, the more emissions we'll generate in the meantime. But we can also reach net zero in 2050 and far overshoot our target of a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in global temperatures. How? This would happen if we continue to emit at business as usual levels, then had a huge realization in 2040 and pushed the throttle on decarbonization. In such a situation, we'll have emitted this much more greenhouse gas emissions than in the alternative scenario, the yellow line, had we had a staged, steady decarbonization. All of these extra emissions would overshoot our carbon budget of 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. To minimize warming, we need to act quickly and effectively. The sooner we can implement climate and net zero aligned clauses in our contracts, the more likely we are to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. The third element of a net zero target is timing. It is international consensus that 2050 is the year to aim for, but some easy to decarbonize sectors should aim for before this. Moreover, best practice is to build in interim targets in the lead up to the 2050 goal as a measure for accountability. For example, in July 2020, the Supreme Court of Ireland ruled that the Irish government was in breach of its climate change obligation as its net zero plan did not include any interim targets. Another element to timing is the pace of decarbonization or the rate at which we decarbonize. This has attracted debate. The European Commission stipulates that for something to be Paris aligned, it must entail a minimum 7% year on year footprint reduction. However, this 7% is a sector agnostic figure Others have argued for more sector and region specific approaches, and there is a lot of work to do to develop more granular pathways of decarbonization. Lastly, we should not forget that in order to stay within 1.5 degrees of warming, we are going to have to be negative for a long time after 2050. Most net zero plans don't even look behind this horizon. When drafting, you should take each industry and organization on a case by case basis and draft with ambition in mind for your particular sector. Remember to hold yourself accountable by including interim targets. The fourth element of a net zero target is offsetting. This is, in essence, paying somebody else to do your emissions reductions or removals for you. We might question whether this is a valid strategy at all. Then, there is the secondary question of, if we do use offsets, how do we govern their responsible use? We also need to think about the quality and type of offsets. Are they offsets that reduce emissions, for example, funding a wind farm? Or are they offsets that remove emissions, for example, planting trees? Do they have additionality? But for you paying for this tree, would it have been planted anyway? Are they permanent in 10 years? Will a climate change induced wildfire burn down the tree you bought via your offset, thereby releasing the carbon sequestered back into the atmosphere? And how do you verify these things? We need to consider whether we want to rely on offsetting at all. But if we do, we need to evaluate the quality of our offsets before including them in our drafting. The fifth element of a net zero target is governance. We want to think about high level engagement for these targets. Are decisions around climate risks taken at board level and how is accountability ensured? Setting interim targets will contribute to this. Corporates should also consider reporting and disclosure frameworks like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, and the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB. The sixth element of a net zero target is a just transition. A net zero transition must be just, both as a matter of principle and in order to get the buy-in of our whole population. Considerations of equity feature in all of the elements I've just discussed. When considering the pace of decarbonisation, might it be slower for regions that are underdeveloped and require more infrastructural investment? Or for industries, offsetting is an international business. Where are your offsets being anchored and how do they impact the economies and communities locally? 
The seventh element of a net zero target is climate policy engagement. We should query whether the corporate's lobbying activities, trade association memberships and public policy positions are Paris aligned. Higher ambition doesn't necessarily mean better. Sometimes we want to draft in a consciously low barrier to entry in order to encourage people to start their net zero journeys. Other times, we might want to pitch the standard really high to push the boundaries of what industry thinks is possible. The most essential thing is to be transparent with where we are pitching our ambition and why we are pitching it at that level. Lastly, a minority of clauses will not relate to net zero at all. They might instead speak to other elements like biodiversity, environmental protection or climate change resilience. For instance, a clause around food supply chains and risks from climate change induced weather events would speak to climate resilience. Reaching net zero emissions is a huge challenge, but everyone has an opportunity to support climate action. In fact, lawyers have a hugely important role to play by introducing net zero concepts into their contract clauses. Thank you so much for listening.